it takes time. Like if someone's eager and wants to do this, the first thing is you got to make sure the community is behind you. Because the worst thing you can do is put together an economic plan for the hospital and not have at all community buy-in. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim Skorupski, and you know you've tuned in to the Triple H, the Habits and Hacks from Hopkins. And thank you so much for joining us. You're in for a big treat, everybody, because I'd like to welcome to today's episode, Dr. Panagis Galiatsatos. Panagis, how are you? Kimberly, my friend, always good to, to be Always good to be within your global sphere. You know, I, I, you and I have uh, crossed paths many a times. You've influenced my own career. And so just when I get an email from you, I don't even read it half the time. I'm just like, yes. I'm like, I think you asked me for something. I mean, I'm, I'm all in. So good to be here. This is really good. Well, before I ask you to introduce yourself, I just want to set the stage here. Panagis, what you do not know is that your name has been brought up and lifted up at least three, four, maybe five times over the past three years on the Faculty Factory podcast. Why? Because I've talked about you and not only your great spirit and your generosity and sharing and honesty, but I talk about back, and I don't know if you remember this, but back when I first started WAGs, writing accountability groups here at Hopkins, you were in one of my very first WAG sessions and you shared a story that would just has stuck with me. And you said, you know, when my, I go to, used to go to the gym a lot and work out. I'm very much into my fitness and that's part of my well being. And we had a baby and all of a sudden I realized that it was not efficient or practical for me to be working all these hours and then going to the gym to work out. And so what I did is I downloaded some app or you, you kind of tapped into some resource where for 10 minutes, you would get a reminder, like three reminders throughout the day to do your thing. And so I've talked to the pod, podcast about how, so he would just be doing burpees or jumping jacks or running up and down staircases and just randomly finding closets to do quick little workouts for 10 minutes at a time. But he did it three times. So he had his half hour working out and then Panagi shared with everybody. And then it occurred to me one day, if I can do this with my fitness, why can't I do this with my writing? And you shared, Kim, you know, I, it dawned on me, I don't need the big chunks of writing blocks. I could get in, get out very quickly with some writing tasks in small 10-minute chunks. And if I did my writing for three 10-minute ch- chunks a day, boom, all of a sudden, at the end of the day, I've done 30 minutes. So everyone listening, this is the guy I referred to. So Panagis. Ha, ha, ha. You've already been on the podcast, <laughs> but tell everybody who you are. Before I forget, I want everybody to know what awesome stuff. Yes, no. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kimberly. By the way, I still do that. Like, you got to understand, like, the habits that I formed with you weren't those just this fleeting moment. They become a movement for me. Where if I ever get the writing itch, right, I'm like, all right, 10 minutes, let me go. If I feel like I can do more, great. Because that's what I've done with my even exercise routines. Like, hey, I can do a little bit more. But whenever I'm tasked to do something or I get the writing itch, I try to give myself 10 minutes just to do that. That way it becomes less daunting and all of a sudden it gets done. So, um, you know, I, it's it's something that's become an academic habit for me and one that's more of a life habit. So that's why I said early when you were introducing me, thank you for influencing my career. Uh, um, so I, I'm going to rattle off my titles and to your listeners, you're like, oh my gosh, keep this in mind. The one thing, if people can, my one advice of academia is if you can bend a lot of these titles to your overall your overall academic arc, then great. They can give you many titles to really keep doing the same thing. And that's what I always strive if, uh, in order to create some efficiency. But I am an assistant professor here. I'm a physician in pulmonary and critical care medicine. And the three titles that I will share with you, because they, to me, they're the most meaningful. Um, one is, uh, um, and I'm going to do it in kind of a linearity uh, where a timeline of how I came to them. One is uh, Medicine for the Greater Good. I'm a co-director there. It was uh, the initiative meant to uh, promote community engagement in order to um, uh, disseminate health and prevent disease in the community. My second one is uh, co-chair for health equity at the uh, Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Health Equity. And my final title, uh, one that means a lot to me because it, it allows me to tie in both of them, community engagement and health equity, is being the director for the Tobacco Treatment Clinic at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. So 
that's that's who I am clinically, professionally here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, but honestly, the, what uh, gets my my blood flowing, my lungs breathing every mm-hmm. morning, is you know I grew up in Baltimore. I I really want to see the promise of medicine make its way into Baltimore, but really kind of a, in a manner that promotes health. To me, um, you know, we if you drive through Baltimore, you'll see you know Charm City or uh, world's greatest city on the benches. I want Baltimore to be the world's healthiest city. And we have all the potential to do that. And uh, that's what I wake up every day thinking, well, how do we do that? Wow. And folks, um, this is something you have to understand about Punagis is here at Hopkins, and I'm sure many of your institutions around the world, we have regular emails that are like the newsletters and various departments and university and hospital system of updates. Dr. Galeet Satos is one of those people where in leadership circles, his name comes up because his name is always in these newsletters. I swear to you, there if there's a week that goes by where your name is not mentioned, I kind of like, oh, I wonder where is, is he okay? Because we keep in mind, we have over 3,000 faculty members, full-time faculty members in the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins, over a thousand part-time faculty members. And Panagis, you're one of these high profile people. I think it's because of part your engagement in the community, in linking and building those bridges between the institution and the city. And your your just your beat, your beat on focus, your your drive and your passion. And I remember that when I met you when you first had, had come here. To Hopkins, and I, I just can't wait for you to get into your topic today because it, I think it's going to give an insight into someone like you who is not only passionate but has figured out how to do that. Because sometimes, you know, a lot of faculty members are very passionate about what what they want to do and what they feel their gift is, but how to actuate those plans can be the challenge because we all have so many hats and so many responsibilities. But um, folks, you're listening to someone who has figured this out. So get into it. I cannot wait to get the juicy stuff going. Well, that, that's very kind, Kimberly. Um, I don't know if I figured it out, but I, I, I can tell, tell you guys about uh, what I'm doing. Um, but that's very kind. Um, and, you know, I, 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 one thing I want to say, and every human being knows this, whether you're academic faculty or not, you always know your success you know, when others have categorized that as that, right? Because you don't realize it's a success or not. Other people usually grant that to you. Like, yeah, you've done something great. But you know, you're you're like, I didn't do this my own. Like you, countless people influence you on that. So it always, it always feels odd to, you know, and thank you for the kind words, but I'm sitting here really as a culmination of other people championing me, mentoring me, even though, and this is what I'll dive into a little bit, even though it's not an arena that people had a lot of, guidance in a sense of like, oh, here's what others have done to succeed in this. You know, I um, I started my journey in medicine, you know, early in medical school. I was like, yeah, medicine is, you're their clinician, maybe you're an educator, or maybe you're a basic science researcher. You know, you see patients, you go to your lab. And I thought that, that was the path for me. In, in medical school, that's who I really was drawn to for mentorships. One at the University of Maryland, where I began my training, and then over here at Hopkins, which ultimately led me to come and do my training here. And then that mentor up and left, which is my first insight into academia. It's not a a permanent position for many people. And I'm sitting here being like, yeah, I'm going to do the basic science laboratory thing plus clinical care. And then um, the the thing is, I I think I began to introduce this a little bit about myself. I'm, I'm from Baltimore. I'm born and raised in the heavy immigrant section. And when I began my training here, I did it at the hospital that served that community at Hopkins Bayview. And that's where I really began to realize medicine and health are not synonymous. Medicine is great, but it has its limitations. And unless you know the community, you can't really help them overcome those health barriers that result in health disparities. And I began to do some community engagement, snowball effect, I'll spare you a lot of the details, but it caught on tremendously, um, had a great chairman who advocated for it, a program director, colleagues. Um, we ultimately launched the Initiative Medicine for the Greater Good in what it is now in 2013. We had Elijah Cummings be our first guest speaker. 
at our annual symposium and he kind of helped us put a stamp of approval on it. Lena Wen also was followed up after that. And here it is permanently to stay. Now, I got to say one quick thing. Everyone listening to me is like, oh, so there you go. You figured it out. You got to understand, I did this while I was in training. Why I need to make that clear is, you know, it, it was my blood, sweat, and tears, but all there's championing, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't grant funded. It wasn't like once training is over, I can just come and join faculty because I got this massive grant. No, there was nothing. There was no funds. We did this in a grassroots approach and we did it because it was the right thing to do. And the community felt that. So one of the earliest concerns I had, you know, Hopkins is sitting here loving me as their favorite employee because they're like, we're not paying you to do this. And this is great. I was at the, actually, at, I left residency, went to the NIH for four years and I was still doing MGG. Easily Hopkins' favorite employee getting paid to do something without paying you. And I say this lovingly about my institution, but now I need to join faculty and I'm not going to give up MDG. I mean, I can't, this is, it's come too far, but there isn't, it's not grant funded. No one knows how to do community engagement to make it into an academic career. I mean, there's health equity researchers and et cetera, but this is, this is a different niche. This is what, when you, how do you get it out into the community? And that was, there's a lot of scary moments in my life. And that was easily, you know, one in early residency where I decided to leave the basic science path, let it go and just really devote myself to community engagement. And I'll stop here, Kimberly, because this, yeah, I don't want to talk too much. I'll, I'll see if you've got some questions, my friend. But this was the second part. Like, do I join faculty at Hopkins, commit to that? I mean, I'm signing a contract with my last conversation being, we'll figure out how to pay you to do this. I'm like, for how long? You know, like I can't sign a one-year agreement and, you know, I, I need some job security. And the thing is, I'm, I was so passionate about this at that moment that I, maybe it was too much of a stubbornness. I wasn't going to let it go. I mean, the community seemed to benefit from it. And there was a lot of benefits. So how do I become an academic physician in academia? As a, to me, you know, we talk about physician scientists, physician educators, physician clinicians. This was being a physician citizen. Yeah. How do I do that without actually a roadmap? Hmm. Wow. Um, yeah, there's so much going on here. Physician citizen. I'm wondering if this is going to be the next like classification for getting promoted, you know, the traditional research track, the clinical excellence promotion track, and the new one, da -da -da -da, physician citizen track. And that is such a profound acknowledgement of that marriage, the synergy between what you just said, that medicine and health aren't synonymous. Oh, mind blowing, mind blowing. And then this, this orientation or life philosophy around community. And it's a starting at the community. And I'm hearkening back to my applied social science days and program evaluation days when I heard somebody say, and it resonated with me, is that nothing about us without us, nothing about us without us. So you, you all, you know, academics in your ivory tower are going to come in and fix this, do that, evaluate this, collect data for this. And we're not even at the table. We're not even, or if we are, you're just kind of like dragging a little seat up there and plastering us on at the end. To me, you, you are living this passion clearly as physician citizen. And I'm so curious. I'm imagining everybody listening to this. Well, First of all, yeah, kudos to you. This is great. And people are thinking, well, this guy sounds wonderful and he's certainly an outlier, but how do you do it? How do you activate it? You said you did not, there's no funding. There's no grant application. There's no LOI or uh, you know RFP out for this. You just said, I, I feel this in my soul, in my guts. I can't not do this. So operationally, without getting too much into the weeds here, because people are thinking I, I'm frozen in time. How do you get people to sign on to something? It's one thing for you to say, I will commit my life to this without pay. But how are you going to commit other people to do it? Oh, by the way, you can't get paid. There's going to be no money in this. How do you how do you share the message? How do you get people engaged? How do you sustain the momentum? As you said, then you went away to NIH. How do you know that it's not all just going to go poof? Let's I want to pause there, but then phase two is, of course, then how do you, as you said, build a career at a place like Hopkins and be recognized for and um, and not viewed as some unicorn 
that people don't want to support or you're so wackadoo out there that people can't even like understand you? How did you, so operationally, one set of questions, take it to however deep you want to, and then bring it on home to now the current day, how am I living and moving forward? So from my standpoint, what I, what I call, th- these are great questions, Kimberly. And, and, and I see this because any of your listeners listening, you know, by all means can reach out to me because I want to make this path easier for others. Because I do think this is a path for the future. You're, I, and I see this because look at the pandemic right now, right? We haven't come up with a cure for COVID. If anything, we came up with a prevention with the vaccine and infectious control policies. And what's, what do we say, right? We ask the community to abide by it, right? And science isn't a religion where people go to the altar and be blessed by it. They have to, they have to understand it. And unless you have a sophisticated scientific approach for community engagement, to disseminate it in a culturally sensitive way without any bias, they're gonna fail. And to me, the moments we're experiencing of the necessity of community engagement, this is where to strike. This is our catalyst to become a movement, to be planted in a hospital healthcare system in, an, like I said, with a sophisticated scientific background that's analogous to an intensive care unit. If I say I see you, I know what I'm getting myself involved with at a hospital. I say community engagement arm, hopefully people will know because MGG can kind of be that standard of care. But how did this come to be? Early in my career, where I was seeing, you know, people really enjoy this, really was more from the community early on. You know, and I shared some narratives here and there but the challenge I, I faced early on was, you know, community engagement to a hospital was like, oh, we're going to do a health fair. I'm like, I don't want to do a health fair. That's not, communities don't, like, I mean, they get a lot of free pens. Like, that's it. Like, <laughs> you know, and I'm not trying to knock health fairs. I think they have a purpose. But I wanted to, you know, from my standpoint, I wanted to do what communities do best, right? Communities have this sense of homophily, right? They have a, they see you as one of their own. They have this okay, sense of transitivity. What yeah. was that word you just said? Homophily, H-O-M-O-P-H-I-L-Y, right? Where they see you as one of their own. And because of that, there's a sense of trust. Health fairs don't have that. You already know, you're, you're already telling them like, hey, we're the hospital doing this and you're coming out. There's no, it's like, all right, well, let's pick up some tchotchkes and move on. There's a sense of what, what we call transitivity, meaning like I heard it from him and, and he passed on it to her and she passed on. Like that's how messaging gets around in the communities. And those are powerful messages. Peer to peer to peer, right? That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to do community engagement that took that into account. It's not a doctor anymore coming out and speaking to the community. It's more of a community member who happens to be a doctor and sharing some information and then sharing it to a group of people who can continue promoting that messaging to others. Have a nice snowball effect because I make it clear. I'm like, I don't want to go out to a thousand people and talk. It's not going to get to everyone. I'd rather talk to 10 and let those 10 translate that to others. That's your impact. That's power. And so from my standpoint, I wanted to do that. There's, there's, there's some sophisticated scientific insight to that, but that's been powerful. I didn't want to do health. So right off the bat, I had to like remold what community engagement meant. But the other part was early on that I realized was it was a community's acceptance of this that reaffirmed it was the right thing to do. Right. I, I didn't go out there with a mindset of, oh, I need to do a randomized control trial. I went out and I sat at meetings and I was like, we could train some health people to be a peer to peer educator. We could do this, do that. We can allocate some resources. But what I loved about the community, they weren't asking us to plant a clinic in there. They knew that. They knew we have too many clinics. That's not going to overcome health disparities. We need people to understand how to read a food label. We need people to you know, be a support group for someone as they're trying to quit smoking. We need people to share some insight for like cost-effective, you know, grocery shopping. We need that. We need health. We need people to learn how to put together a resume to apply for a job. That's what the community needed. And I was like, we can fulfill that as as dual community individuals who happen to be doctors. So that's what we began to do in the beginning, but right, creating these peer -peer educators under a guidance called the Lay Health Educator Program. But where we really solidified our moment, where right? I'll tell I'll tell people these stories of the community and so forth. I, I did a lot of writing, Kimberly, from the WAG, the early days of the writing uh, from our writing group that you put together, and you know I, I I did the academic thing, right? We wrote papers. I put out. I mean, I shopped it to any journal, a, a good one, PubMedable, that would have this. I'm like, look, it's not an RCT. 
I'm going to write it with a lot of social theory. Here's what we do, describing it and putting it out there. To me, I saw this no different than the writings in the 1930s and 40s of surgeons. But like, let me tell you how, about how I did a case. Well, if you can get published then as you're making breakthrough cases, I should be able to publish about how we're engaging with the community early in, in community engagement since no one else is doing it. So that's what a lot, like I was playing the academic game. Right, because I knew if if MGG was going to be seen as more of than a feel good story, pat on the back, I got to do the academic thing. I needed to come with sophisticated scientific approaches that are at the end part of social networking theory. Right, so I can make sure that this is not your health fair. Which again, it's fine. That's not what we're trying to do. By the end of the day, it's always going to be the community champions, that, and they were. 2015, Baltimore had its uprising with Freddie Gray, and you know every. Everyone in Baltimore, internal look like who are we? And our program director at Hopkins, Colleen Christmas, Erica Johnson, right, the former and the next, they wrote a beautiful editorial published in the New England Journal of Medicine saying, We have MGG. That's how we know we'll continue being in the community. And up until that point, I'm like, I'm at the NIH at this moment. I'm like, Is this going to go away? I'm trying to, like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep it going, like breathing life into it over and over again. Well, when you got it published in New England Journal of Medicine, fine, some level of credibility in academia. But I'm telling you, I mean this to all your listeners, that's, that doesn't get the ball rolling. Like you can publish in top tier journals. It, it, it stays within our own circles. You know what I mean? Like it's just us. Pats on the back. Yay. I, I took that and I gave it to the Baltimore Sun. It's like, this is what we're doing. So you're like, all right, sounds good. Let's go and cover this. And they came. They took some pictures of us at an event. I'm like, all right, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Until December 24th, 2015, Christmas Eve, I get a call from my aunt. My aunt, uh, you know, one of her jobs, an immigrant uh, here in Baltimore, she delivered newspapers, right? So two in the morning, she got up, delivered newspapers, and she calls me at two in the morning. I'm like, someone died. You know, why I asked what an aunt call you at two in the morning? I'm on the cover of the Baltimore Sun. For that edition for MGG. <laughs> All right, that's good. It's getting some community attention. And then President Daniels calls my chairman, who then called. I mean, I get a call from my chairman. I'm not even at the uh, Hopkins technically. I'm like, I did something wrong. No, they called because President Daniels got this beautiful letter from Congressman Cummings saying, I read about MGG. Keep it going. This is great. And President Daniels did the typical Hopkins thing of saying, I don't know what it is. You got to tell me what it is to my chairman. <laughs> He's like, enlighten me. I got to respond back to our congressman. <laughs> but that was it. That's when we, we had a symposium. And you can still watch that, that, that uh, symposium from 2016 on our website. And it, to me, what, what I didn't realize, what Congressman Cummings did that day, and this was told to me by his staff later, that speech he gave, if you heard him speak after that day, he gave it a lot. And we were the first people to hear it because he, I think that's when he discovered he was stricken with a, ultimately, as we know, he passed away, but he wanted to make sure like the next generation is in good hands. And he saw MGG as one of those pieces that could allow the next generation to be in good hands. So what I'm alluding to is, you know, Elijah Cummings wasn't acting as a congressman at that moment. He was just acting as a community member who happened to be a congressman. And so we, that's the value of MGG came because the community bought into it. We got our publications, we started holding symposiums. So meaning at the end of the day, and I'm not saying this is probably the right way, we put pressure on the system to make sure we stay here. All right, fine. Now I get hired and I continue doing the academic thing. And right, and the one way I've made sure we can adapt to the needs of Hopkins is multiple ways. But one is teaching our next generation of doctors how to do community engagement with sophisticated science. This isn't just going out like, let me talk to you. This is how do you do public speaking? How do you do grassroots conversations? How do you go at them without any implicit bias? How do you learn of a culture and go and speak to them? I want these doctors to know this as well as they would, you know, if they were placing a, a, a central line or doing a bronchoscopy. Two, I've touched base with almost every research group at Hopkins saying, we work with a community. You have never done that. Many of you never have done that. And I can tell you the number one thing that bothers the community is when you go out, I got a grant, I'm going to do this. And then we climb this ivory tower. Like, I'm happy to help be that bridge. It's not easy, but we've been doing this. And then now really the way I think that continues this 
solidify us is the pandemic. I mean, we've been the most consistent game in town of having COVID-19 conversations where Mayor Scott pulled us in to say, you're going to be part of our medical religious community initiative. Great. We've been doing it. Today, our COVID-19 community call had over 40 listeners. I mean, we continue getting people coming in. And these are leaders who then can go and disseminate this messaging. You know, so it's, it's, it wasn't easy, but I do think a physician scientist, I'm sorry, a physician citizen is another track record to con- consider because community engagement, I think it, 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 it is the, it's not the, look, this isn't a revolutionary thing. This is actually taking medicine back to its roots. Hippocrates coming out of the island of Kos, going into Athens. That's what, I mean, there wasn't a notion of a hospital, but that's what physicians did. They just worked in the community. They didn't work in a clinic. I think there's a place for clinics, don't get me wrong. I still think we got to go out there to promote health, not medicine. And we got to do that as, as being seen as equals to everyone, that, that sense of homophily. And it doesn't mean, it may, it, like I struggle with it when I go into black communities when they see me as another white guy. So I have to establish, no, no, like I'm born and raised here. I have my own narrative that I can't tell you is yours. And then when I go to the Hispanic Latino community, they're like, you're not Spanish. I'm like, I know. I'm going to come at you as a human being, right? And establish that. And that's what I try to train to all my colleagues, like wherever you go, you always have to win over the community because the superficial stuff may not be there you know, immediately. And it's, it's hard to have a, a representative, but that I wanted, we wanted to change that too. But at the end of the day, you, you gotta be mindful of the community you're speaking to. They gotta see you as one of their own. And so, yeah, sorry, I, I've, I'm long-winded at the moment. I apologize, but I, I just firmly believe this. We're, we're doing what we need to, to be seen by academia as a sophisticated scientific approach. And at the end of the day, every healthcare system, I think, needs this. And I don't care if they call it MGG or something else, but they need this. This is, you know, and the pandemic has proven to this, proven us more than ever. So a couple of things. This this is so, your passion is palpable. And this is just an, an example. Again, this is, every time I think of you, I just feel electricity because you believe this so strongly. I want to call this out right now before I forget. Medicine for the greater good you said there's a website that people can listen to this recording. What's the website? Is it easy that you can say it right now clearly so folks can go there? Yes, it is. Medicine for the greater good.org. There you, you go. You go there and you click under news and events. When you click under there, you'll see MGG Symposia. When that pops up, just keep scrolling down. You'll see last year's symposium was with our, our, I think, you know what? I'm going to get flagged for this, but I'm going to say it's our best gold medal swimmer from Baltimore. I know everyone will say it's Michael Phelps. I think it's Jessica Long. <laughs> so Jessica Long came on and she celebrated the um, 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act. So you can watch that from last year. You go down, you'll see 2019 where we had Emmy award-winning director, Marilyn Ness. She directed Charm City and shows she discussed how art can help with community engagement and medical community engagements. Um, 2018, we had Dr. Kamara Jones talk about institutional racism. Maze, I mean, that was one of my favorite ones. I mean, mind blowing. Uh, and then 2016 is when we had Lena Wen and Congressman Cummings. Keep in mind, we had actually Lena Wen booked. She just came on as our health commissioner. This is before she really blew up. And we had a bumper by our week for Congressman Cummings because it's hard to not. He was like, I'm going to come. I'm going to talk. <laughs> so, yeah. So, medicineforthegreatergood.org. Click news and events. You'll see MGG Symposia pop up. Go and watch some of the prior ones. Second thing before, how can people get in touch with you? Is your contact information on medicineforthegreatergood.org's website or do you want people to email you? Yes, email us. So um, our email address, it's on the website, but it's also M for medicine, G for greater, G for good, MGG at jhmi.edu. Email us, connect away, you know, happy to participate, happy to collaborate, happy to have you just be a fan. Our next one, on a side note, just a little self-promotion, our next one is November 16th. Can really we'll make sure that you get the date. November 16th, our keynote speaker this year is, drumroll, his name is D. Watkins. We don't know who D. Watkins is. The letter D. Watkins. He is a New York Times bestselling author. Um, his I don't. I think his biggest book was The Beast from the East, and it talked about um, growing up in East Baltimore City, 
with massive gun violence and so forth. He's recently uh, co-wrote Carmelo Anthony's biography. And D. Watkins is just an amazing human being. I mean, he's, his books, are they capture Baltimore. Okay. And he'll come and he'll talk about how to invest in the youth. So very excited for that. So cool. November 16th. Yeah, I'll make sure you get, you get more information on that. All right. So I, I don't want to go too much deep in this because, again, I feel like I, we, we could talk for four hours and people would be riveted. Um, because not only have you taught me so much in addition to words, I love words, homophily, I love this word, but um, this whole navigating the road without the roadmap, this to me seems like your MO, your modus operandi has just been, you figure this out on the fly. And I can't help but think as you've been describing this endeavor and this mission that you are clearly on that has been planted so deeply in you, I'm thinking that there have to be faculty out there going, I too feel a calling to do this where I am right now. I'm not in my hometown. I am other than I don't, I'm not from here, but I genuinely, this is my adopted home or my adopted people or my adopted neighborhood, my community. I want to be that person. I want to be a Panagis Galeatsatos insert city here, but I'm not from here. This is great for him. It almost seems like, you know, organic that he went, he's in his hometown. He's a known entity. He knows the streets. He knows the neighborhoods. He knows the restaurants. So he can speak their language and say, yeah, I may not look like you, but let me give you a background. And you get a little bit of credibility that way. How can you give some advice to people who have, who share your enthusiasm and your passion and your now quest and zeal for this new physician citizen title how can they go about embedding themselves in and being trusted in a community? So this is huge because that's what we want to do. We want to disseminate this. And I don't want my own personal unique narrative to be like, what is the key ingredient? No, like as much as I'm sitting here advocating for MGG, I also don't want to be its barrier. I don't want people to see this as like, well, I can't do this because I don't have the same narrative as Panagi. So I, I need to undo, not undo that, but I need to, make sure others have the ingredients they need to be successful. So one thing I want to say that helped me embed it in academia is I really did go around pitching this to, you know, my own division saying, use us as your community engagement arm. So meaning we ended up getting put on grants. Now it wasn't me as the PI, but they submitted grants saying like, Hey, we'll have MGG as part of our community engagement arm. You understand that got scored highly well. Cause you're like, Oh, you have an arm that already has been doing community engagement. That was seen incredibly credible. And so it helped actually be a plus for a lot, a lot of research groups. I mean, we were on a ton. The other part though, that I got to say, so you want to start this, you have to think of this as a long goal. You, you got to think of this as planting a red oak, meaning you're going to spend a lot of time with the watering process. And when I look back on this, MGG, you know, wasn't even up and running in its current form. I say 2013, it had something going on in 2013. Don't get me wrong. But really, I can sit back and say 2018, specifically when I joined its faculty, is really when it just took off. Um, right now, we, we, we hired, uh, you know, our chairman hired a second physician who, to oversee this with me so we can launch it at JHH. But the reason that it took that long is because it took that long to continue earning the trust of the community. Right, so if you're sitting back saying, I, I, want Pani, I want to do this too. Yeah, I get that I have that narrative, but you got to understand having that narrative, I still went to people who didn't see me as Baltimore because I didn't look like that or I didn't sound like that, right? And so that's, a you know, my immigrant story of Baltimore is my own story. It doesn't mean it jives well with everyone else. Yeah. Now, those are huge lessons to learn. And those were important because to me, it that's when it began to humble me. Like, you got to understand, first going out doing this, and many people may have this feeling, like, I'm going to go out, I'm going to help them. You can't. That's not what they want. They're not a charity. The community is not a charity. So my first first request, if you feel like you want to do this, it's going around and just sitting in. Find out where they're having town halls. Find out when the church meets, and you can just go and just sit down. Like, hey, I'm Dr. So-and-so, but I'm just a community member. you got to do a ton of listening. And it may take a year or two years before you really know what you can effectively begin to do as a product, meaning as a service to the community. That's where we've realized 
peer-to-peer educators, you know, that's the model. It's called Lee Health Educator, but it gets residents to teach them, or doctors in training, community benefits because they go out. I mean, it fulfills so many things that the community wants. Like they get a certificate, they put it on their resume. We teach, we bring HR out to say how to leverage that. Some of them have gotten hired. I mean, well, there was a person from the public house housing sector who got a job that got them out of public housing. It was amazing. It's a great story. That's really what MGU was about in the beginning. I mean, we promoted it because we were teaching that in a, a, a way as well, but it takes time. Like if someone's eager and wants to do this, the first thing is you got to make sure the community's behind you. Because the worst thing you can do is put together an economic plan for the hospital and not have at all community buy-in. You got to go to the community. And when you get their buy-in, you're like, yeah, well, we're here. Because they know it's bi-directional. They know they're going to be getting a gain that helps them. Mm-hmm. Once that occurs, then you begin to share with everyone else, like, how you can do this. You know, what are the wins for a hospital? You know, I'm, anyone can email me. Right, right now, we're working on showing a really diligent community engagement arm can help prevent COVID-19 spread in the city. That prevents hospitalizations and so forth. That's huge. Mm-hmm. So it's... It took some time. You, you, you got to be creative at the same time. Look, while this is a vision, I'm stubborn. I want it. At the same time, I also got to make sure it can provide a service for Hopkins. And that's key, right? You, you got to make sure it's adapting towards your, your hospital and what people need of it. As much, you know, the, my biggest humbleness that I will share is you may have a vision, but you got to make sure it can adapt to everyone else. Um, there was a point in time, by the way, on a side note that it was pitched to me by a private philanthropist, break off, go nonprofit. And it, it seemed appealing because I can kind of like dictate my own terms. But the other part of me was like, then it, it, it drops accountability from Hopkins. And I didn't want that. Mm-hmm. I wanted, I wanted Hopkins to, to have a strong community engagement arm. I, because if it can happen at Hopkins, there's no reason no other hospital can do this. And I know this because back in August, I was at the university of Patras. We were like, you know, Hopkins is a big name. It's like the Nike of, of medicine. And they're like, we want to do what you guys are doing. This sounds great. So that, that, that's what means the world to me. And it wasn't easy. There's some academic creativity that you can get this going. And you may need to do that for the first couple of years, but you got to get the community on board. You got to get them to not, it's not a buy-in. It's one that they say, that's what a hospital should be doing for us. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. You're working for us. Yeah. Yeah, we are. That's your health that we care about. Yeah. So that you, you've said so, so much. It's, it's about re, I hear community community building, but I it's deeper than that. It's about relationships. I hear communication. I hear persistence. And what to me, one of the threads and the denominators is the authenticity because communities have memories. A lot of institutions, medical institutions have bad relationships or legacies that are not so good with with communities. And there's a level of distrust. And there are um, some shaky histories and historical occurrences that that make some people in the communities be leery, understandably so. So this is, the authenticity has to come from something there. To me, the test, the litmus test is, is this something you can age in the future and are you okay with not having done it? Is that going to sit well with you if you don't do it? Because this is not a short-term grant where again, the community knows I've seen you, I've seen a hundred of you. I've seen a hundred of you. you. You're this young, ambitious person. You're trying to make a name. This is going to be a drive-by community involvement kind of a thing. It's going to be short time. You're, uh, you're not in for the long haul. This is different from that. This is something where it's a passion. It's a authentic. This is coming from a depth of you that is unlike anything else. And so I'd add to your thing of like, you're, you're uh, reminding us to use us as your community engagement arm that the effort, I mean, what I heard from there was how you helped pitch this to the fellow academics was, I'm building something that's great for the community. Yeah, rah, rah, cheerleader, but this is how it helps you. So you, you made sure that you see the bi-directionality, but it's also about that authenticity. And I'm in this for the long haul. I'm not going anywhere. And that to me is, is really important. So that if you're out there listening to this and thinking, well, I want to do this. This sounds like a great thing that I can put on my CV. 
this is not something, this is not that, right? This is something a lot bigger, deeper, broader. This is a mission. This is a passion. This is a, this is a, a lifelong endeavor, right? 100%. And I will say this, the community will, they'll make, they'll let you know if they feel like you're using them. There are, there was um, a, a lot of what I've been doing uh, with this, you know, the biggest skill is always listening and the most humble and, and hum, being humbled over and over again. I remember Reverend King over, East, uh, west side of Baltimore, there's a different hospital system that cares for them, but he would reach out to us. Long story short, we were pulled into an interview together and they asked him, they're like, why do you, why do you keep bringing MGG back? And he's like, oh, the, because they show up when they, when we ask them to. I'm sitting here and I'm like, it's, it's when you're called and if you don't show up, and he's like, oh, I'm too busy, et cetera. Then you lose the community. Like, cause you got to think of it. They see you. If you begin to earn their trust, they will see you as a community member. What do community members do? When they're called to be there, they be there. Not with their own agenda. That's the other part, too. Number two is you don't dictate the agenda. You work at the pace of the community. Yeah, yeah. You show And then I think of it like the holiday yeah. meals. When you're part of the family, when grandma or aunt Josie has the Thanksgiving or the whatever meal, you're at the table. You show up. What do family members do? You show up. And so they're kind of like the test is, are you going to cut bait? Is, oh yeah, he was yeah. a short timer. He got what he wanted from us. She blew in, blew out. And now that we helped her get promoted, she's off to bigger, better things. Now this, this, this is here. We're putting down deep roots. We're not going anywhere. And that's the beauty. I think what you're doing is involving the institution, involving Hopkins says, this is, we're burying this down deep here. This is not going anywhere. This is not going to be plucked up very easily. We're embedding this it's here to stay. And that to me makes a difference. This is not when the grant funding runs out, we're out. Yeah. It, you you got to understand Baltimore isn't, you know, their distrust of the medical system, which I imagine is similar to other communities, isn't, you know, Henrietta lacks the past plays a role. Don't do not get me wrong, but it is not the talking points that the community brings up to me. It is you treat us like a charity or at, or at the same time, you use us for your own promotion. They know this. They know about the grants and all that. They get it. And for many communities, they, they don't have another option. So yeah, they'll say yes, but not, not because they want to. And the more that you sense that, the more it's going to cause a friction. Of course it is. So then when a public health crisis comes out and we're like, you got to do this and this and that, they're like, why should we believe you? Of course, I, I, I get that 100%. So invest in the community engagement arms now. you got to find the right people. That's the other thing too. Like these skills can be trained and taught, but every physician knows at some point in time, you pick up that level of empathy. You do, you, you pick it up, you, you develop it. It's not really trained. Your, your patients teach you this. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with community engagement. At some point you begin to understand that you'll stop seeing yourself as the doctor. I, I just remember, Hey, you remember some of my colleagues are sitting in meetings with the doctors here and they're just like, yeah, Oh yeah, that's me. At some point when you've really immersed yourself in the community, regardless if it's where you're born or not, all you got to do is just, just be there. Just keep being present and actually own that story. Like, yeah, I was born in Nashville, but I'm here right now in Boise, Idaho. You know, I, what a beautiful community. And I, I'm trying to be one as you all. Your narrative will speak more volumes to them than anything else. And that's one of the things we always try to train our physicians, our residents who are out there. You've got to establish homophily. And it's not, you don't take on Panagi's story or Dr. Cujo's. You take on your story. Like, hey, I'm Dr. Rebecca Greenberg. Story. Yeah, and yeah. everybody has a story. And that, that level of honesty, it get, everything gets down to sitting around the campfire and telling a story. I got, Let me tell yeah. you my story. Everybody loves, oh, you got a story? Once, I mean, when I was teaching, I told, told the story before. When I was teaching back when I just first started academia, I'd be in an auditorium of 200 people teaching introduction to sociology. They'd be, eyes would be glazed over and I'd stop and I'd say, let me tell you a story. And it's almost like, like the hedgehog, the eyes are like, what? There's a story? People love stories. And when we share our stories, we become real. Now we're three-dimensional, real human being. I don't know really what's going on, but hey, well, let's all just walk each other home. Right? Let's sit around the campfire. That's it. So I, it's so beautiful what you said that no matter where you are, hey, yeah, I'm not from here. I'm from Boise. But gosh, do I, I really want to, I love this community. I want to know more about it. I want to. 
I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. That to me is a start of the authenticity of sharing ourselves as people, human beings on the same place. So whew, I'm going to let you have the final out because I'm just so blown away by so much here, especially this concept of physician citizen. So speak to us, Dr. Pedigis Galeatsatos as a physician oh. citizen. My last comment, uh, you know, uh, and this can be true of any job, any profession, you know, um, you'll be asked to do a million things. I, I, I know I've been blessed to do something that I'm passionate about. It took me a while to accept that, you know, because, you know, no one else charted this, et cetera. But look, yeah, I, I think there's a variety of things in academia that um, you, you can not be burnt out from. And if you are truly passionate, even if there's not a roadmap, there's people that will provide you, you know, like we're talking about roadmaps, fine. There's a roadmap. Sometimes it's good, but if there isn't, then find people who can at least prepare you for the journey and who are going to advocate for you and surround yourself with us. It won't be like, I, like, I think there's only one lung doctor that I worked with. Everyone else was social workers or hospital administrative people. In academia, I think to survive, you've got to surround yourself with people who are willing to invest in you and in your idea. And mm-hmm. if you get those people, You'll succeed. Hmm. Oof. Don't you love it? Everybody, don't you just love this stuff? Please check out medicine for the greater good.org. Dr. Panagi Skeliot Satos, you are awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. You are so important. And thanks for joining the podcast. An honor. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.